Hey everybody, this is David Paul, the host of the Capital Stack Podcast, where we talk to entrepreneurs, founders, operators, and investors about all things value creation and startups. Today, I am talking to Nicholas Lopez, who is a principal at HCAP, formerly known as Huntington Capital, which is a MES debt fund um, that is backed by the, I believe, the SBIC, and they also are an impact fund, which we're going to go into a little bit more today. Nicholas, how you doing, man? I am doing well. I have a little bit of a sniffle, but doing well. Is it COVID? No, not COVID. Thank God. But just it's you, one of those things where your kids are back in school and you, you seem to catch it. But you know, I feel I feel pretty good otherwise. Do people care about COVID anymore in in San Diego? You know, I there's a few that you know drive with their masks still on, but most people in San Diego are mostly mask off right now. Yeah. So not too bad. Anymore. And you took your mask off for the podcast. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Cool. Well, Nick, thank you so much for coming on. I'd love to know. I mean, first of all, for the audience, I want to know what Mez debt is, right? And I want to know yep. what you know where HCAP forms, and I'd love to kind of understand a little bit more about your background and how you came a part of the the fund. Yeah. So you know, a little bit of background on HCAP. We've we've been around since two thousand, and as you mentioned. We primarily provide uh, mezzanine debt, which is a form of subordinated debt, junior capital to lower middle market businesses, primarily in the Western US. We also um, provide equity in the form of either mostly preferred equity, but some common um, to companies that are typically 10 to 100 million um, in revenue and one to 10 million in EBITDA. So these are businesses that typically need growth capital and that are kind of been around for, let's say, five to 10 years or even longer. Uh, so they're past the venture stage, they're past typically, you know, the early stage growth capital or venture debt stage. Um, but they're also not looking to raise, um, you know, larger equity checks from, from larger private equity funds. So we kind of fit that niche in the marketplace where, hey, maybe they need some form of growth capital. They're their PL can utilize our MES debt in a, in a structure that makes sense to them where, yes, it maybe is more expensive than senior debt, right? If they can go get bank financing, we tell, you know, our partners, like, go ahead and do it, right? That's a cheaper form of capital to raise. But a lot of times there's, you know, personal guarantees or other requirements on, you know, an asset coverage that they can't, um, you know, they don't have, right? So we can kind of fill that void, that niche in the marketplace. And we find there's a lot of opportunities. We get a ton of deal flow. I mean, historically we focused on the Western US and we we target, you know, California, the Pacific Northwest, Texas, Arizona. Those are our sweet spots. And there's just a lot of underserved markets, businesses that don't have access to a lot of this this type of capital. So we get a lot of deal flow and we see a lot of opportunity for our for our type of capital. Yeah. And so when you say you know, subordinate debt, you're generally sitting junior to like the four to six percent senior bank line or term loan that, you know, a, a, a traditional big bank would give. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's so senior lender will come in and, you know, either they, they can come in with us on a deal, but a lot of the times they maybe already have access to some line of credit and we're going to have to subordinate, have a second lien position on the company's assets if we do some form of as debt. Right. And seeing that you're sitting further down the capital stack, you are taking more risk, which in turn needs to be paid for. And your investors are primarily institution or excuse me, or like our, uh, it's a fund structure. It's a limited partnership, yeah. correct? Yeah. G Standard GP partnership. We have, you know, investors, many bank investors, um, you know, foundations, family offices, et cetera as an SBIC fund. So we do have that LP capital structure where there are investors in the fund. And then we also have, as you mentioned earlier, we're an SBIC fund. So we have SBA leverage from the government at up to two times leverage on the fund. Yeah, which sounds like a really super easy process to obtain, right? <laughs> I wish, yeah. No, it's a long process. It's a grueling process. You have a lot of things you gotta do. For sure. Yeah, I can I can name like, I think the funds on my hand that I know that you know, are able to kind of go through that process. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the first time that we as with the current team that we, you know, got the green light letter and ultimately final approval, it's it's definitely a long process. It can take, you know, up to 18 months, maybe even longer sometimes. But 
this second round, we just had a recent close on fund five and the process was definitely a lot smoother, a lot easier because we already kind of know a lot of things that the, the SBA and the government needs for, for underwriting. And so when you're making an investment, you know, you said you can do, you know, mezzanine debt, you can do convertible debt, you can do actually equity. Does yeah. the SBIC put any handcuffs around any of that on what you can do and what you can't do? I mean, is there different pools of capital that you have to draw from yeah. for different investment instruments? So good question. I think what we've been doing historically has not changed much under the SBIC program. The, the things that we typically look at are you got to have the majority of the employees in the United States or the headquarters is based in the U.S. We've been doing that anyways. Right. And if you look at, you know, maximum interest rates that you can charge on any given load, prepayment periods, the, the, the ability for the companies to prepay a loan, things like that haven't really hampered us down. There's minor things that we've had to change in our legal docs. But in terms of finding deals, it hasn't changed really that much. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And so you could actually, if you wanted to, provide complete equity under the SBIC rules. I mean, of, of course, you sold your investors on, on credit, but like there's no, right. like if you have an SBIC instrument, you could do credit or you can do equity. Yeah. So for us in the current fund, you know, the typical structure, like historically, has been 75% debt, 25% equity across oh. the portfolio, okay. right? And what we've always said is that we're always going to have some form, historically in the prior funds, as opposed to this new fund is that there's been some form of debt as part of the capital structure. But in the current fund, we have the ability to do equity only out the gate, as long as the portfolio construction over time trends towards that, that level of 75, 25 debt to equity. Now, is that, is that just, is that just, in, is that to just juice the return? Yeah. Right. So if there's opportunities to put additional capital into companies that we think are going to be, have a lot of growth or, We've maybe we've already put debt into the company. We see additional growth beyond what we've already invested. We definitely want to put equity in what we believe will be, you know, the winners to get additional return on the fund for sure. Do you ever run into the problem where like a conflict between a debt and, a, and an equity holder, like if the company goes flat? Yeah. So, you know, obviously there's there's concern, concerns around lender liability, right? Because if you're an equity investor and you're on the board and you have equity thoughts and obviously you got to act as a lender too you got to do what's with what's in the best interest of the company you can't you can't be telling the company what to do right because then you have concerns around those types of issues but yeah i mean typically we structure the docs so they don't have any potential conflicts but yeah we're, we're very well aware of those potential concerns for for the companies that we work with so that's what, like I really like about your model is that you just have such incredible flexibility, right? To really just kind of form and provide the the, the instrument, uh, the facility, the equity sleeve that the company needs, and you know really try to you know form the capital around the company instead of the company around the capital. And I think that that's a pretty unique uh, feature. Yeah, I mean that's what we've really been part of our pitch over the years is that we can be pretty flexible. We get we get a ton of deal flow where, hey, maybe it's just an equity only deal. Maybe it's just a buyout and they're looking for private equity investors. And sometimes we have the conversation with them like, well, do you really need to raise all this equity today? We can do a convertible note, as you mentioned. We can do straight equity. We can do half debt, half equity. We can be very flexible in how we approach it uh, to work with the company so that, you know, ultimately it, there's a big education process and helping them understand what MES debt means, because a lot of people don't get it right away. They're like, wait, you're just a high interest rate loan. You know, why would we pay 10 to 12 percent? And we say, like, hey, we agree 100 percent. Go go try to raise senior capital. But, you know, we get a lot of calls back. You know, they can't raise senior and then they don't want to raise equity. So like I mentioned earlier, we, we filled that void there um, in the marketplace. Yeah. And you give a lot of the founders a lot of optionality, right? And yeah. in the in the fact that, you know, a big round usually comes with a real pain in the ass board member that's growth at all costs. I mean, generally speaking, I mean, you're investing in growth companies, but these things don't need to have binary outcomes for you to be successful. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, exactly. And there's a lot of concerns that, you know, these big private equity firms or big institutional capital type firms will come in and dictate a lot of what's going to happen at the company. And we say, hey, look, we're 
actually placing a lot of value on you, Mr. Founder, that's been around here for a long time. We're, we're making a bet on you and the company. We're not looking to take over. We obviously want to provide value add and act as a sounding board and do a lot of value add things um, from a value creation standpoint. But, you know, we, we take a different approach there. We're putting a lot of our efforts and our investment dollars into, into founders and, and helping them grow their business and supporting them. Would you say that did Huntington or HCAP, did they, were they always kind of a growth oriented player or did the market just kind of push them there due to like being like mezzanine debt being pretty competitive, like in the lower middle market? Yeah. Historically we've, we've always focused on entrepreneurs and, and providing them just capital. I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with, with the history of, of HCAP, but you know, it was, it was founded back in 2000 by Dick Huntington. We're formerly known as Huntington Capital. Mm-hmm. And uh, the first fund was an SBIC fund. It was like just, I think it was around 30 million back then. It was a whole different team, but they were looking to provide entrepreneurs in San Diego access to capital. And what they found was that this form of mezzanine debt through the SBA program was, was an attractive alternative in the marketplace. But really the HCAP that everyone knows today wasn't really institutionalized until about 2008 when we raised fund two, a $78 million fund. And that's where all the growth occurred with, with the firm and just to focus on lower middle market companies um, that need access to some type of, of junior debt in the marketplace and, and equity as well. How did you, uh, how, so how did you, what's your background and how did you stumble into age gap? <laughs> Good question. So I actually, actually, one of the few that was born and raised in San Diego. So I actually, I moved away for a while, but came back. Um, so I, I grew up in San Diego, went to undergrad at San Diego State, graduated in 2000 and moved up to Orange County and joined an investment management firm for about five years, a firm called Aegis Asset Management, and then got into investment banking uh, up in Orange County. Uh, I guess the firm today was, it was RSM Equico, and then it merged into McGladry and then it merged into some other firm. And then I joined another investment bank called FMV Capital Markets. And this was back in like 08, 09, when we had the Great Recession. And I was actually interviewing with, uh, you know, Tim Bobnack, our founding partner today, or our managing partner today, uh, when they were raising fund two. And obviously the timing didn't work out well just because of the recession. But, um, you know, we stayed in contact. Um, I ended up getting my MBA at USC and uh, actually moved away to, uh, to Minnesota to um, join Best Buy on their, their venture capital group, Best Buy Capital. So okay. I was there for almost four years and Tim reached out to me when they were raising fund three. So I actually joined right at the first close of fund three back in June of 13. So almost 10 years uh, ago and um, it's been here ever since. Awesome. And you love yeah. it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the best part of the job is just meeting you know, all these entrepreneurs and hearing all these stories all over the country. So absolutely love it. So what's impact investing? How does HCAP think about that? When did that come apart of the firm's DNA? Yeah. So, you know, we're known for our gainful jobs approach and and really our goal as a firm is to facilitate a, a positive impact on underserved businesses, their employees and their communities. Um, without sacrificing return, right? Uh, we, we're big believers in that. We've been recognized, I think it's nine years now, as an impact assets 50 manager, one of the top 50 impact managers worldwide. And um, how many you know, are there? Really, like 60? In, in that list? I, I don't know. <laughs> no, what, I'm just kidding. No, there, I, don't, I don't know what the total I just is, didn't but. realize that there's that many people that specialize in impact investing that have gotten to your scale, right? Yeah. Well, it's, it's worldwide. There, there's a lot worldwide and there's others that focus on the environmental aspect, not just job growth, what we're, you know, on our gainful jobs approach. But, you know, for us, if you think about the evolution of our firm, it really started back when we were founded, right? The, the first funds focusing on job growth. And really over time, when we, we realized when we got to fund two back in 08, we were capturing good job quality data. And so we we're making an effort to provide capital to, you know, minority owned businesses, woman owned businesses, companies that were in low to moderate income zones. Right. 
And then we, after, you know, we were raising fund three, we, we made an effort working with some of our LP investors, some of our thought leaders in impact around more about intentionality and how can we really, you know, improve job quality um, standards at these companies and workplace practices. You know, our, our goal with our gainful jobs approach, and I'll go into that real quick, is to really increase you know, employee engagement, reduce turnover at these firms and improve financial performance across the organization. And really we're helping with recruitment and retention of the company's staff as they experience growth, right? And through this gainful jobs approach, what we realized was that there's a couple of key areas for our investors and for HCAP that we thought were important. And one of those buckets is economic opportunity. You know, we think about broad-based participation in the firm, opportunities for you know profit sharing plans 401k programs you know other ways to get ownership in the firm opportunities for advancement training and promotion uh, are they earning sustainable living wages um, the other side is, is health and wellness you know are they getting what type of paid sick days you know what wellness initiatives benefits are they getting and then most recently we're focused on diversity and inclusion as a core bucket area for us you know if you think about the board senior staff and the overall um, mix of employees at the firms. Um, these, these are some of the things that we're focused on in the current fund. So over time, like I said, it was just job growth, but we realized that just wasn't enough. It has to be more of a gainful jobs for all employees in the organizations. And so on this particular front, when we think about what do you define as a, as a gainful job in this economy, it's really important in the marketplace because a lot of people don't focus on this, they may focus on increasing jobs, but not what we call a gainful job. So that's really separated us from the marketplace. And actually, it's a big differentiator for us in the marketplace when we pitch companies, because we bring this up, we, we show them our like our annual economic impact reports, and they get really excited. I've received actually written notes from CEOs after I met with them about, wow, you're the first private equity investor to ever care about all of our employees. Um, so they get really excited when they hear this. and. You know, ultimately, there's a lot of firms that we work with that are best places to work for, like in the city of San Diego, and they're already doing good things, but we're just helping them build out a roadmap over time. Let's say over like a three to five year period of what they can continue to do to be continue to be a best place to work for in the city that they're operating in. So how does how does all of that fit in, you know, on the portfolio? That sounds like post investment portfolio tracking, data tracking, yeah. governance. Yep. How does all of that fit into the sourcing side and kind of setting the stage to this is kind of what you're about before you kind of you know get to a deal, right? I mean, because they have to be on board for this type of investor, right? Somebody that is yep. you know impact driven. Yeah, another great question, and this is something we talk a lot about as a team. And value alignment, values alignment is is a really important part of our diligence process. So. Right away on the first call or two, we talk about our impact approach and how important it is for HCAP to have this as a part of our investment. And we know right away if they care about it or if they don't, but I would say you get a pretty good feeling right away. And I would say nine out of 10 times, they're very supportive of what we're bringing to the table here. So usually not an issue for us um, in terms of value alignment. I think a lot of people are trying to do good things. They just don't have the bandwidth. They don't have the HR departments to do right. these things. They don't know um, what best practices are. Right, exactly. And so we bring that to the table and they actually really like it. So it, it's definitely something that, you know, during diligence, we're like, hey, this is going to be important to us post transaction. We just want to make sure you're aligned with us on all this. And like I said, nine out of 10 times there. Yeah, and if you if you set it up during the diligence, it shouldn't be too hard to track as the company matures and progresses. Oh, yeah, we, we, we actually in the legal docs, we have language in there that says, we, you know, we want to meet with them quarterly to go over their initiatives. What are they accomplishing? We actually use a third party software provider where they can upload results for the quarter and how they're improving on their initiatives for the year every quarter. So we're tracking this data from the company quarterly um, and we're working with them to, to understand the data and to see what they're doing to to improve workplace practices. And the natural benefits of this are obvious, right? For a company side, you know, better yeah. retention, better engagement, all just better everything. Um, on a fundraising side, 
do you feel like um, you kind of fit into some pools of capital that kind of make it easier to raise? Because you know certain institutions and family office have um, impact type initiatives. Do you find it more of a deterrent? Like, how do you kind of think about that on the fundraising side? I would say early earlier on, you know, and this is a while ago. Let, let's call it ten years ago. Impact was relatively new. We were at the forefront of what we call impact investing today. A lot of people are talking about ESG and how people invest in, in environment or social and governance programs, but impact investing as we define it today. We felt that we could do a lot of uh, good in these communities without sacrificing return. So, yes, when we and earlier on, people are like, "Well, you guys are below market returns. You know, you're not going to meet our requirements for for returns." And we're like, "Well, because actually, they, because, they, because they associated you with the ESG." Exactly. So, mm -hmm. what we showed them through our performance, we are actually exceeding benchmark returns, and we were doing really well. Um, and so that helped us, right? You know, if you look at the benchmarks and and what we show you know, to the market and to our investors, um, that's not a prohibitive factor anymore. They know that you can return, um, have returns that exceed benchmark indexes that are not impact related. So I don't think anymore that's an issue. We do have many investors, like you mentioned, that are focused solely on impact and they love what we're doing. Uh, but we also have many bank investors, family offices that um, you know, have allocations for impact. So it's just having those discussions and looking at our returns and they usually um, you know, are very supportive of that. Yeah, no, I think that's fantastic. I mean, the, the art of impact, what's so great about impact um, practices, I feel, is that like all you have to do is really try and you can just see so much demonstrable you know, difference in companies. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's just putting on, making it a priority and you can really raise the bar significantly. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, I would say with everything that's happened the last couple of years, you know, with, with COVID remote work, this is becoming even more important for what makes a good quality job. I mean, pay is always top of the list, right? But what else is important for employees? You got to consider all these factors, have policies and procedures in place so that, you know, there's not a lot of turnover that obviously turnover has been massive in many industries the last couple of years and we're hoping to, to mitigate that through this this approach here do you think that that's going to be the case in the next couple of years high interest rates environments you know contracting economy inflation four dollar bunny bread do you think people are going to still be you know resilient to to going to work well we'll see right i think you know what one example is we have a portfolio company called fleet nurse in our most recent fund, um, they focus on healthcare staffing for nurses, but it's it's what we call per diem on demand. Mm -hmm. They know about the massive turnovers with nurses due to burnout over the last couple of years due to COVID. And um, they focus specifically on allowing uh, nurses to get real time shifts within 24 hours. Maybe they want to work at different hospitals and not, you know, work the midnight hours all the time, but there's other shifts available. So we know this is occurring in the market. So we're looking at different business models too that can support the needs of, of employees in the marketplace in different industries. That's important for us. But I also think what you mentioned, if the economy does sour and go sideways a little bit, yeah, I mean, th this is gonna be a pretty, pretty important part of it, but I don't know, we'll, we'll see how deep it goes. Yeah, I think healthcare, there's always going to be a demand, right? I just think yeah. that's a function of just there's not enough supply. You know, the, the yeah. nursing schools aren't pumping at them enough. But, you know, yeah. I think about just low income jobs because I, I see so many HR, I'm going on a tangent, but so many HR staff or HR recruitment and engagement companies out in the market, you know, <clears> SaaS, and it seems that they're solving 2020, 2021 problems, right? Yeah. And yeah. I'm not necessarily sure, like, are they going to be set up to pivot into like, okay, well, you know, we are fully employed, you know, people are, you know, it's more of an employer's market than an employee's market. And, you know, we're, what's going to yeah. happen to all of those? Yeah, I mean, like, like I said, good question. I don't know how deep this, this potential recession is going to go. I mean, you know, the, the employees were in charge this, this last year, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But it's, it's definitely going to shift in the marketplace. I think there's a lot of things. If you think about what we do, the gainful jobs approach, we try to make it cost prohibitive 
So, or cost neutral in a sense that we're not looking to bring extra expenses onto these portfolio companies. So they can still provide attractive options potentially to, to these employees uh, without taking on too much risk, you know, if, if the economy sour. So they can still be, you know, an attractive place to work for, um, but it's just how they do it, right? Exactly. So yeah. how do you guys, how are you guys modeling returns and, um, and term sheets and structure and deals when the interest yeah. rate doesn't know where it's going to fall? I mean, are you yeah. doing variable type of like, you know, type of lines and stuff? No. So we are doing fixed rate only, and these are term loans over like a five year period typically. Mm -hmm. And we'll have, well, the way that we've historically structured deals is, you know, let's just say like there, it's a 10 to 12% interest earning deal. Maybe there's some pick, we'll get some warrants. Um, historically we've had like 12 to interest, 12 to 18 months interest only earning periods, but we've done a lot of like 36 month interest only um, periods. Um, and we do a lot, you know, in the healthcare and technology space. So it fits well with those models, especially the technology companies. Um, but you know, for us, deals haven't changed that much, even in oscillating markets where, you know, interest rates are going up or there's a recession. In fact, our capital becomes more attractive in the marketplace when the economy starts to go a little bit South, just because now they're seeing interest rates go up. They're not, they don't have. Uh, traditional access to bank money or, or, mm -hmm. or private equity guys. So we, we can be very helpful in, in those markets. We just got to be really good at, you know, understanding these deals and making sure there's not like a ton of risk. How did they survive back in 08, 09? If they were around, you know, did they fare, fare well enough to make it through that? Right. Got it. Well, Nick, thank yeah. you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. A couple can questions. What is your favorite book? Oh, geez. Um, one of my favorite books is Cadillac Desert. I don't know if you've ever heard of that one, mm -mm. but it's about how the West was built with, with water rights. And it's a really interesting book, you know, how California is really a desert. Where's the water going? Who has access to it? You know, how is, how are all the cities built out on the West coast? Really interesting book. Okay. And what's the best piece of business advice you've ever received? Um, don't, you can't lose sleep on deals that are going south or you won't last long in this business. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. You won't make it long. Yeah, yeah I, I like that. I like that. Well, Nick, thanks so much for coming on. We are the Capital Stack. We drop episodes every Tuesday. We're on all major platforms, Apple, iTunes, and Spotify. If you like it, please do so. I just realized I was number 98 out of 100 of all tech podcasts in India. So if you want to, you know, give us a comment, you know, help us, you know, maybe get to 97 or 96, that would be super awesome. And uh, comment, tell a friend, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.